All right, so uh, what we've been doing in this class so far, uh, we've both been uh, exploring the work of James Hillman, the uh, quality, the character, the legacy of archetypal psychology, and we've been doing it both through a, uh, a, a kind of a dialogue between Hillman himself and Jung, uh, also a contextualizing of archetypal psychology in the larger depth psychology tradition, that that would necessarily, um, that the Jung Hillman dialogue would necessarily entail. Uh, and we've been uh, exploring Hillman in a, through his own eyes in many ways um, as he's looked back on his, on his life and work uh, and influences. And while well, we'll keep doing that, but I want to uh, have today be especially focused on understanding Hillman in a larger context than we've been looking at. And that is in terms of uh, the larger uh, evolution of, of, of worldviews in our, in our uh, civilization, um, and particularly the crucial move, the transformation that's been going on in the last uh, half century, uh, above all, but really for, for uh, over 100 years, in the, in the uh, modern uh, Western and increasingly global context. So um, I want to be, this is very much a contextualizing uh, lecture. And um, I want to enter into that by thinking about what, by pointing out um, something that was, I think, especially compelling about Hillman uh, why he inspired uh, so many thoughtful people in the last uh, um, 50 years. His work started coming out 50 years ago, but particularly became well known after 40 years and then 30 years, uh, it really um, kind of through the, you know, from the mid 70s uh, onward, his work really became very uh, topical. Uh, it, it transcended depth psychology itself. While he was, of course, especially known there, he wasn't uniquely known there. He, he, he was one of those few figures within depth psychology who became a kind of public intellectual and started influencing uh, larger, larger circles. Um, and I think we can pinpoint one of the reasons that he took on this uh, he, he be, became such an inspiring and compelling, and, and by inspiring, I mean not, he'd, he'd hate it to think of him as, as like kind of inspiring, like the way, I don't know, uh, Nelson Mandela would be, or uh, Mother Teresa, or somebody like that. Inspiring more in the sense of sparking uh, other people's creativity and original viewpoint in terms of being provoking, provocative. Uh, in, in that sense, he was uh, inspiring. And he was also, I think, compelling because, and this, this is the, where I want to get to, he managed to uh, essentially out-contextualize the dominant worldview of his time, which uh, to a great extent is still the dominant worldview uh, of, of the present, and that is uh, the legacy of, of the modern the modern enlightenment, the Western enlightenment, and the and the modern scientific perspective, with its sharp uh, distinctions between a a, a, a subject, uh, a reflective uh, subject, and an objective external world, um, and that is essentially uh, material and can be understood through uh, disenchanted uh, procedures. The, um, he did this in a way that appealed to not only psychotherapists uh, uh, by taking on the dominant worldview within psychology and psychotherapy, which would be the, um, the mainstream psychiatric 
professions um, perspective. He not only did it there, he did it in a way that appealed to people in the humanities, in, uh, in religious studies, and in the pastoral and religious uh, spiritual uh, um, uh, communities, and uh, to many people in the you know, new age, new paradigm, etc in the humanities especially, liberally educated uh, what the intelligent general public. He reached them and he appealed to people because he was able to take the, the dominant worldview and in a certain way, th through sheer erudition, um, culture, wit, style, um, intellectual complexity, he was able to um, place all the, the dominant worldview in a context in which it, it was seen as an emperor without the clothes that it had been assuming it uh, could um, uh, present itself with. He, he, in a sense, kind of laughed at the bully. Um, he, he had a um, such a profound connection with the with the longer cultural tradition that has constituted the Western um, literary, imaginative, religious, as well as um, uh, philosophical traditions. He showed such a kind of multilingual uh, comfort in many. Um, in in the the major works, the deeper perspectives that have informed the sequence of worldviews in the West, that he intimidated the opposition in a sense through this artistically engaging show of intellectual and cultural force. He did it with eloquence and style, and in that sense, I want to emphasize how much those are not peripheral things. The eloquence and style were essential to what he achieved, and they came out of his uh, cultural uh, um, erudition and his confidence within that, which didn't come right away for him, as he's discussed, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, m more in, in, still in these last two lectures today and next week. He, uh, he often described it as like it was a long time coming. Uh, he felt it takes so long to pull things together. One goes through such a period of, such a long period of confusion and disorientation. Uh, where you don't really think you're ever going to pull it together. Uh, he, he, he was very candid about sharing that kind of um, uh, journey. But he clearly had found it by the time, uh, really by the late 60s, and by the time he gave the lectures in the early 70s that, at Yale that became revisioning psychology, he definitely had it. Um, You could say um, he, he revivified in his recovery, he, he was kind of reconnecting to or, uh, the, the longer tradition, the elders of the tradition, in a way that revivified their creative potency, um, much in the same way that um, like Australian Aborigines in, as they uh, part essential to their rituals is a kind of revivifying of the creative potency of, of archetypal beings, of, of ancestral beings um, that uh, they experience as, as living within um, all the different places that are, are their, their centers of, of dwelling. Um, in a way, this was, this was Hillman you can see as he's going back to each of these people, whether it's people who weren't not as well known to the general public before he recovered them, people like Ficino or Vico, or people who were well known like Plato and um, uh, 
Blake or Coleridge rather and um, uh, Keats, he, uh, but he recovered them in a new way. He brought them, he revivified them, uh, bringing this kind of coherent multiplex perspective to bear on on so many issues that face our uh, our consciousness today. And he did this in a way that was both European, you know, remember he was there for over 30 years, um, the, 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 the cultured part of him, the part of him that's, that's learned, that's uh, multilingual, uh, that's in touch with the primary sources and the secondary sources of the, of the grand tradition. But he also did it as a, as a born American, as a, uh, as a kind of irreverent, um, rebel, restless, jazzy, improvisatory, um, uh, a trickster, a knight errant, overthrowing the old uh, monarchy uh, in, a, in an assertion of the kind of uh, common life of the soul. Now I want to bring our attention to a particular part of, um, of a very, I think for me anyway, affecting passage, uh, just a sentence where he lets us know in a sense, it's like a confessional moment, he lets us know what motivated him. Um, he says, we this, this quest for understand, for, for discerning the archetypal, the mythic, the imaginative dimension in, in, in our lives, in our experience. And in this sentence that's uh, from the preface, the original preface on page 21, if you got the new edition, um, towards the, it's just one sentence, uh, towards the uh, bottom of the second, the second last paragraph, he says, we search for the myths within the facts the archetypal patterns that can broaden and deepen connections in ourselves. And here's the, the uh, crucial part. Offering our painfully raw experiences a bed of culture. Our painfully raw experiences a bed of culture. You can see how this kind of richness of, of cultural and poetic um, sources that he draws on throughout revisioning psychology they're not just a, sh a kind of show of force. They're not just kind of showing off, uh, though he does show off um, uh, with, with, with a kind of insouciance, a kind of, you know, uh, love of, <coughs> of the pirouettes that he's doing <coughs> with ideas and language. He is doing that, but there's something more going on. <coughs> he is he is uh, going to culture, he's going to the, the great uh, literary, poetic, uh, philosophical <clears throat> traditions in order to um, con contextualize his, his own suffering, his uh, symptoms, his neurosis, uh, and he offers this as a way for all of us to do it. In a sense, uh, Freud does this from the first moment in 1897 where he writes a letter after having had these four dreams where he said, I have felt the gripping power of Oedipus. And from that point on, Freud um, uh, is um, rooting the, the understanding of the psyche, of the human psyche, of the deep psyche in a cultural, a mythic and archetypal perspective. And, and he never lost that. You, you read Freud in um, some of his great works, even in the, uh, like from the 1920s and 30s, things like um, Civilization and Its Discontents, or Outline of Psychoanalysis, or uh, even the technical things like beyond the pleasure principle and the ego and the id, uh, he, he is, he's really seeing mythically 
in some at some points he can sound he can sound more mythic more Im imaginatively rooted than Jung who I think is partly compensating for the fact that he's farther out than Freud and so he can kind of want to sound more reined in more scientific more uh, more abstract uh, well Freud goes right for the poetic um, Eros and Thanatos as these personified forces that are in, in combat with each other, or the ego, the id, the superego. That's when, um, so when Wittgenstein says we, calls psychoanalysis essentially a new mythology, um, he's, he's talking about Freud's whole, whole style of, of s seeing and writing. And, uh, that that quote about from Wittgenstein and mythology, Hillman draws on, and he does a Hillman does a very particular move with this. He 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 presents it, and Wittgenstein is is criticizing depth psychology for being a mythology, and Hillman uses the put down as a compliment and says, "Yes, that's exactly what it is." Um, and that's one of the, the moves that Hillman frequently, uh, he'll take the, he'll take the, uh, the put down, he'll take the uh, critique and uh, turn it upside down. That um, like the, the, the conventional treatment of Ficino, the view of Ficino as, and Renaissance philosophy generally as being uh, inadequate philosophy compared to what would come later in the Enlightenment, etc. And um, Hillman says that, and that's precisely the point. It should not, re Renaissance and Ficino uh, philosophy should not be re read as f philosophy. It needs to be read psychologically, and that's where its depths are. Um, now, I'm not presenting that perspective of Hillman's as, as my own, but I'm showing you how he is. Uh, Turning upside down the um, the the critique, the conventional critique, to make it into a compliment. Um, and he also, by the, I, I love how he singles out um, remarks from other scholars that you might not know about. I mean, there's so many. This is the like the footnotes alone, but all through the book. But the footnotes uh, in particular have so many treasures. Um, con concealed uh, here and there in the notes of qu quotes that are, um, I mean, he read widely. He often, he told me he didn't tend to f read books from front to back. He didn't tend to read systematically. He didn't read comprehensively. He just, he was too restless and just went in, read, read you know, these pages, got the sparks, got the, uh, and then ran with it. Um, but he had enough familiarity with the big picture and with who's who that he could do that and not kind of entirely make a fool of himself or he, uh, at all, but instead um, uh, uh, say insightful and knowing things on the basis of his um, pulling out the, the, the crucial uh, insights. He had a trust in a sense that when we open you know, we, we pick up a big book and we look through it and we're kind of drawn to this, this page or that chapter and then that's the one that we needed to read. Um, that's the one that opens up its, its, uh, its, its treasures. So here's, uh, here's a, um, he's talking about the, um, yeah, here, here, here's this thing about uh, Bulger's argument that uh, the preoccupation with mystical fancies and social behavior weakened the impact of, of impact of Florentine Platonism as a serious philosophy. And then Hillman adds, uh, Bulger's argument is just our point. It is valueless to, valueless to read it as philosophy. Um, but then um, here, in, when he's recovering Neoplatonism, which, you, I mean, generally, Depth psychologists were not talking about Neoplatonism in the 1970s. Um, Neoplatonism was, I mean, it's a much more vivid presence here at CIS and in the PCC program than it is in most universities uh, uh, th uh, around the world. And, um, 
as and and it informs our vision. It's not just a kind of quaint antiquity uh, that we're looking at in a um, as in a museum, but it, uh, Hillman played a huge role in bringing Neoplatonism to our serious attention um, 30, 40 years ago, 40 years ago. And here's this fantastic uh, quote by, um, that he takes from uh, J.N. Findlay, F-I-N-D-L-A-Y, um, probably the leading mm, academic uh, philosopher defending Neoplatonism uh, eloquently uh, in, in the second half of the 20th century. And this is a great quote I, uh, from uh, his book, Finley's, Finley, by the way, was, for those of you who know him, Joseph Prabhu uh, had Finley as a teacher and um, one of his professors in, at uh, Boston. Um, and in Finley's uh, chapter towards a neo-neoplatonism in his book, Ascent to the Absolute, he, uh, Hillman brings this great quote. He says, and I shall be prejudiced even to the extent of using abusive metaphors since the best way to bring home the sense and worth of Platonism and Neoplatonism is to pit it against such inadequate types of thought as Aristotelian individualism, Germanic subjectivism, Semitic Protestant theology, let alone extreme empiricism and certain forms of atomistic analysis." End of quote. See how he just, he, he, he's, the person who said that, Finley, is speaking with such authority. I mean, he, he's, he used to teach in, um, yeah, thanks for shutting me up. He used to teach at the, um, I think it was Oxford, uh, but he was um, in, in the British uh, university system, and he um, edited all the, like, works of, of ac academic uh, analytic philosophers. You know, he, he knew his way around Wittgenstein, around... Um, uh, Popper, uh, Russell, and so forth, and then he could come out with a statement like this. Um, it's very, it's very Hil Hilmanian. Now, all the, uh, by, by the way, I think it was Nietzsche who particularly gave Hillman a stance by which he could um, uh, take on the mainstream, uh, the dominant worldview, and through uh, a kind of intellectual confidence and cultural um, erudition and wit and style um, uh, critique very powerfully the 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 dominant um, cultural paradigm i think I think you particularly see that in in Nietzsche as much as anybody else um, and in in the U.S., you can see somebody like William James has is in the background of Hillman, where he's he's able to William James through style and um, of writing and uh, as well as through his cultural awareness, he can he can be talking about things that were completely disallowed from serious uh, intellectual discussion, like spiritualism and. Um, uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness triggered by nitrous oxide and, and mystical experiences and so forth. So James is kind of in the background there too. But that's all that I've been talking about before, uh, uh, so far, was um, in a sense like his, his personal inspiration and, uh, and it's also his style of impact, but I want to now speak about how does he fit into this this bigger picture, and um, I want to first draw you your attention to this passage on page 197 from the chapter that you uh, read for this this week, the the last, where he was t um, talking about the Renaissance, and here you get a little glimpse of. This is about as close, I think, to the moment of uh, rebirth, a spiritual rebirth, what Groff would call a, the, the, sort of like peri, the fourth perinatal matrix, where the, the, the unexpected spiritual opening is, as you're coming out of the birth canal uh, 
takes place. This is as close to, as Hillman gets uh, to kind of affirming that particular gestalt. And he does it in a way that you can see it shines a light on his whole work. Um, this is at the beginning, this is after the excursion on uh, uh, Petrarch's um, uh, ascent of Mont Ventoux. And then the, the new section is, uh, on page 197 is Renaissance Neoplatonism and Archetypal Psychology. And then he says this, often in the course of a therapeutic analysis, a revolution in experience occurs. Soul is rediscovered, and with it comes a rediscovery of humankind, nature, and world. One begins to see all things psychologically from the viewpoint of the soul, and the world seems to carry an inner light. The soul's freedom to imagine takes on preeminence as all previous divisions of life and areas of thought lose their stark categorical structures. Politics, money, religion, personal tastes and relationships are no longer divided from each other into compartments, but have become areas of psychological reflection. Psyche is everywhere. He then, <clears throat> then this is the entree into the rest of the, uh, the chapter. This revolution in experience took place on a grand scale during the Renaissance. Um, but you can, he's clearly speaking from a, a, an intimate personal experience of great significance for him. And it's the, uh, uh, something took place, <clears throat> and I think it, from various clues, I believe it particularly took place um, in a dramatic way in his life in the spring of 1969. Um, from different things that he's, he's said. And this was kind of like the birth of archetypal s psychology. N notice how he uses words like the inner light. Um, this is not your usual Hillman uh, phrase, the inner light. Everything seems to be filled with like an inner light. And it's the inner light of uh, the archetypal eye has been opened. It's a kind of discernment. It's, it's, he's now living a symbolic life. That's the, that's, that's the crucial shift. You're no longer living in just a literal world of objects. You're living in a world in which the multivalence, uh, the symbolic, uh, everything is symbolic. Everything is ambiguously multi-leveled. Um, there's an artistic, uh, poetic dimension to life itself happening at all the time. And that allows you suddenly, he's, then he brings things up like the soul's freedom um, the, uh, to imagine um, widely, freely, and to bring things together that are normally compartmentalized. That's a crucial move. Now, in order to, uh, you can see he's harking back to the Renaissance. He's also harkening, um, harkening back to, uh, a renaissance not seen as all light and glory, but a renaissance that is constituted upon a great descent uh, into the underworld, uh, into the, um, the, the, the dark aspects of life and death, depression, death itself, um, the, 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 the crises and um, despairs that he describes as taking as characterizing so much of the of the Renaissance culture that we can easily in a superficial way partly just from the from the tight the name itself um, project a a sheer kind of light and glory um, kind of uh, perspective image onto it now I'd like to um, take a couple of minutes now to, uh, so those of you who've done other classes with me are going to uh, already know this, this basic f framework, but I'll, I'll take, I have to set out a foundation so that all of us are on the same page. And so what I want to do now is um, situate Hillman by understanding what preceded him in the uh, unfolding evolution of the Western worldview. And the crucial thing to see in that evolution is the 
radical difference uh, that, of, that distinguishes the modern worldview from uh, virtually all other worldviews, primal uh, uh, worldviews, um, non-Western worldviews. And that fundamental difference is a sense that the uh, human self as a subject lives in a world uh, that it is, it is a fundamentally different from and separate from, uh, uh, and in some sense superior to, because of this capacity for uh, rational um, uh, apprehension and interior re reflection. So uh, there's a very sharp um, boundary between the human self as a subject and the world as an object. The world is, um, is, is just matter uh, and energy. It's impersonal, it's unconscious, it's, uh, it, it's, it's disenchanted. All, all enchantment in the wa modern worldview is a function of human subjectivity. It comes from the interior world and this is the, the human self in here. So this is the, this is the modern. Um, you particularly see it emerge from the time of Descartes and Bacon, uh, uh, but it is stronger and stronger uh, as the uh, 18th, uh, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries progress. <clears throat> um, by contrast, just to draw the, um, the kind of pr primordial alternative, th the sense that the 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 uh, the ancients the, the 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 primal the tribal there's different words that used to be called primitive the participation mystique uh, that perspective is one in which um, the self and the world are far more uh, interconnected and undifferentiated relatively relative to the modern and um, where soul and spirit are seen to exist is not just inside the Cartesian subject uh, but uh, is throughout the throughout the world uh, and self as a kind of unitive um, uh, uh, whole and the 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 trees the sky the heavens don't miss Venus and the moon tonight in conjunction and and uh, Jupiter they'll all be in the western sky as you might have seen them last night with the crescent moon and then, then uh, Venus very bright and then Jupiter very bright. They're the three brightest objects that you can have uh, in, the, in the nighttime sky and they're all um, kind of beautifully lined up there in the west. Uh, on these um, gorgeous uh, days and evenings. So um, the, t the, the trees, the wind, the, 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 the ocean, the heavens are experienced as, as being imbued with psychic and spiritual presence, presences, uh, that the human being is in some sense um, uh, continuous with. The, the inner life of the human being is continuous with the inner life of, of the cosmos and of nature. Uh, and that continuity is, uh, is experienced in ways that permit a kind of ongoing communication between uh, the human psyche and the world, that the world communicates mythically, archetypally. There's that famous um, passage from Joseph Campbell uh, that uh, he begins the fir on, on the first page of The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Campbell says, it would not be too much to say that myth this kind of symbolic perspective, this, capa uh, this capacity to um, see life in terms of archetypal figures, narratives, uh, uh, con constellations. It would not be too much to say that myth is the secret opening through which the cosmos pours its inexhaustible energies into human cultural manifestation. Um, so there's the cosmos Im imbued with soul. This is like the anima mundi pouring uh, through, uh, uh, 
through myth, its meanings, its, its soul, it, uh, becomes intelligible and um, communicative to the human being. And, and so there's a, there's a certain uh, you know, participatory relationship between um, self and world. But it's also, uh, there's, it, th there's far more kind of empowerment of the individual self here compared with the, the, this, much, this more immersion in, let's say, a tribal identity or the identity uh, uh, that, the, uh, that the human being has and interconnected with um, other forms of nature, with the place that one lives in. Um, Etc. Uh, here, there's 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 the objectifying of the world um, empowers the the subject. It increases the subjectivity by increasing the objectification. Um, the two uh, go together, and it also increases autonomy through, for example compared with, the, let's say, the passing on of generation after generation, the passing on of belief, ritual, practice, myth, um, within a, um, an, an ancient, uh, or very ancient, like say, um, primordial society, there's not a lot of change from generation to generation, um, while, by contrast, the, the amount of questioning that is done of the given meta narrative in our time is just spectacular and that is made possible by the um, emergence the forging of an autonomous self uh, aware um, uh, critical consciousness that uh, looks at the tradition as something to question, not just something to live. <clears throat> and it also creates uh, all sorts of potentials, negative and positive, for exploiting the world, because you, the world is an object, it's not one's matrix. Okay, so there's a different relationship. All right, so this is this, this the primal uh, here and the modern. And then there's one huge um, step, and there, there, there's, there, there's quite a few steps, but there's one major uh, kind of stopping point that I'll um, isolate here that brings us from, bet that mediates between these two. And this is the uh, uh, an enormous religious um, disclosures that characterize the axial period. Uh, in all the major uh, world civilizations, but uh, 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 of the first millennium BCE, but particularly uh, what's focused here in, in the Western context, coming out of Israel and, and Greece. Um, and in these, here there is a new sense that the, the divine and the ultimate locus of value and spirit and soul is in a transcendent dimension uh, that is in some sense distinct from the imminent world of nature, of the body, uh, of um, conventional experience. And that uh, one can reach this um, uh, transcendent only through uh, a, a, a certain, um, through, through different means, but the, but compared to the, the more kind of democratized participation through ritual and so forth in the divine. Um, and then there's an intermediate stage here where the, uh, the uh, archaic civilizations began to um, have the divine very much located in the um, uh, theocratic structure of society and a, an, a kind of imperial or uh, kingly um, power, uh, uh, then that finally reached to a point where there was not just ki a divine king that one lived with the, uh, under, under and participated in the divine through uh, that, um, that sort of semi-divine human, but rather you participated directly in the divine through a more uh, either 
as a philosopher in Greece or as a mystic in India or a sage in China or a um, prophet in, in Israel. And in each of these cases, these are people who are not by birth given their divine um, access, but rather through um, uh, spiritual, um, you know, their spiritual journey, their, their whether through uh, grace or you know, prophetic uh, or mystical illumination or philosophical uh, rigor and, and so forth. But in, this helps create um, the possibility of critiquing the, the, the world of society, of the political uh, structures and power structures, because you don't have just a, um, like the, the king can no longer say, uh, I'm, the, um, I'm the source of the ultimate spiritual authority here because there's a prophet who can say to the king, um, there's your king in this world, but there's a, there's a king of kings that is more, that is from a, a transcendent dimension that, your, uh, that places your uh, actions in a different context that can be judged uh, outside of the political power structure. Um, but this is connected with a gradual um, kind of uh, shifting of the existence of the um, ensouled world's spirits and uh, powerful beings and then polytheistic uh, uh, mythologies and goddesses and gods and so forth, and it mo moves much more to a transcendent monotheistic perspective, where there's there's one God, one higher truth, one reality, uh, and this um, this uh, s differentiation and separation is largely accomplished by um, masculine symbolizations of the uh, divine and of the human. Uh, and associations of the divine with the transcendent, with the uh, with the um, with light, with um, uh, beyond the uh, imminent imp empirical world. Okay, so um, so we'll just so primal, um, axial. That you know that term. Axial religious, it's uh, from uh, Yasp Jaspers and the, um, the whole first millennium BC, but particularly around the 6th century BC, BCE, uh, when everything from Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, uh, to um, the birth of Greek philosophy, the, the great Hebrew prophets that turned uh, the Hebrew um, imagine uh, kind of theological imagination in a new direction uh, right across the um, these different civilizations there was this tremendous new kind of polarity between this world and a transcendent world between the many and the one between body and spirit between um, uh, opinion or maya or illusion versus uh, brahman or Nirvana or tr uh, truth, um, the the true reality in Platonism. It's here. This is the this is the 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 higher uh, reality of the archetypal dimension. That light that is beyond the cave. But we live in the world of a cave of shadows that we need to transcend. And our body is a prison of the soul, etc. That all these um, distinctions emerge out of the much more kind of shamanic primordial uh, unity and this serves as a way station a crucial way station be because uh, a way station to the to the modern because um, if we could move this over here uh, let's, I'll put it in smaller form the human being has a special relationship to the divine Man is made in the image of God, uh, to use the King James Bible's uh, 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 version of it. And, in, and 
the implication is that the hu human soul, um, the human spirit, has a special relationship to the divine in a way that the rest of the world doesn't. Um, and human history, and this is particularly coming out of the uh, Hebrew prophetic tradition, human history becomes the locus of divine activity and the focus of divine activity compared with the eternal cycles of nature, uh, death and rebirth in the, in the ensouled um, uh, natural world uh, becoming the, being the focus of, of, the, of ritual and divine participation. Now human history uh, a, as a working out of God's plan and the importance of, of uh, a kind of moral rigor and, and sort of asceticism in the service of this divine unfolding and that human salvation is attainable uh, either through um, posthumous um, uh, elevation beyond this world uh, or through a or, and or through a kind of millennial um, end of t end time that will will bring the 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 ret return of the divine and a reunion with the divine in a way that will be salvational okay so i'm i'm packing up uh, a lot into this uh, ridiculously uh, a kind of condensed and simple uh, trajectory of of our kind of evolution of world views but you can see the general picture now starting about a century ago um, with uh, Nietzsche I'm gonna put these this kind of radiant solar uh, self because like this is the Cartesian self I think therefore I am that sense of great robust um, consciousness of being a subject that can act on the world and make a difference and shape the world through its own wit and will um, wits and will uh, intelligence and and uh, purposefulness see and that's that comes for out of this a kind of introjection of the divine um, nature and the crucial period is the period of in in the Renaissance Reformation and scientific revolution particularly the Copernican Revolution where there is like a, this huge download as it were of the divine uh, you see it in the Adam being touched by God on the Sistine Chapel ceiling that Michelangelo paints at the same time that Copernicus is getting the, the insight that the sun is the center uh, uh, of the solar system or of the universe as he thought. Um, and Martin Luther breaks out of the church and, uh, and, and establishes the um, direct relationship to the divine as being um, the foundation of, of the religious life huge kind of emancipatory uh, almost divination of the human being is taking place at that time and it gives to by the time Descartes comes he's just sweeping away the whole past and just saying we've got to uh, question everything and use our own intelligence that, that is is God-given he's, he's he's basically inheriting the medieval theology but in a way that it becomes a foundation for the robust, modern, rational uh, objectification of the world. Does that all make sense that I'm describing it? And um, so that's why we call this the um, monotheistic ego. This is like basically the Cartesian, um, solar, heroic, monotheistic ego. All of, all of us walk around with. Um, we, we come into our, we, we make our decisions day by day. We um, have that sense of autonomy and self-possession and self-reflection. Uh, these, these are all kind of inherited from this enormous psychological development that was um, uh, mediated by um, the sequence of philosophical, religious, and then scientific uh, as well as social political breakthroughs. Now, starting about uh, the end of the 19th century with a figure like Nietzsche, 
um, but ma many others, uh, he's sort of the prophet. Um, this world of, and worldview of that robust humanistic um, sense of progress that, and, and that the, we had the capacity for objective knowledge through scientific reason and empiricism and that uh, the West was the best and, the, um, and that human uh, consciousness had a kind of, um, uh, was a kind of crown of creation. Even after Darwin, you, you still have a sense that the human being uh, is the, in terms of the survival of the fittest, is the fittest of all. It's the top of the ladder. It's the crown of creation. It's still there. But by the time you get to uh, the late 19th century um, and the beginning of the 20th, there, this entire um, worldview starts to undergo a profound descent. And this descent, um, it takes place in many different ways. You, you see it in the, uh, the realization, for example, that uh, when Freud says psychoanalysis brings the third wounding blow to the n n narcissism and megalomania of the, uh, of the human self, because the first wounding blow is the Copernican um, decentering of cosmic decentering of the of the of the earth and of, therefore of the human being, and the second is the um, Darwinian biological decentering of the of Homo sapiens as being a special divine creation as a, as as it was for the uh, biblical um, vision, and then Freud says and with psych with psychoanalysis, there is the revelation that even the rational self is, as an, as an egoic structure, is just a, an epiphenomenon uh, of the primordial id, the cauldron of the instincts, and it's not master of its own house. And so that, they start drawing out these sort of problematic consequences uh, of the of all the modern revolutions, and um, the the under the recognition that, in terms of knowledge, that if the human mind uh, is seeking to understand a world that is fundamentally different from it and from which it is separate, then to a crucial extent, our subjectivity is going to contaminate our objectivity. We're never going to really see the world as it is in itself. We're always going to be seeing it shaped by our own um, uh, largely unconscious um, uh, subjective structures that could be shaped by language, could be shaped by the paradigm that, uh, that we were um, educated within, that could be shaped by, our, by gender, by class, by race, by our historical uh, period, um, by our um, biological uh, limitations, by socio-biological factors. Kant is the crucial figure who, who sees the extent to which we constitute our reality through um, subjective structures, but uh, it's in the course of the uh, n n later 19th and then 20th centuries that all the implications that people like Foucault or Kuhn or feminist uh, uh, critics uh, and, and um, post-colonial thinkers and et cetera, start to deconstruct this worldview, the sense of progress, this, uh, the, the myth of progress, the, the, the myth of the, of the subject. Um, the universe itself gets radically uh, expanded so far that we become really, really um, d uh, diminished and peripheral, uh, decentered in a way that Copernicus and Galileo could never have imagined. Uh, and um, in time, in, in space, uh, in knowledge, um, in all these different ways, there's a great uh, kind of descent that is, is, is happening. And the, 
and instead of that, that robust sense of the Cartesian self, which unconsciously, by the way, identified with the sun, with the Copernican revolution, the reason it felt that it had, uh, the reason the modern scientific mind and the modern self did not feel like right away a sense of being uh, horribly uh, decentered and disoriented was because human reason had seen and understood the nature of the cosmos as never before and it identified with the solar logos of the uh, un un unconsciously of, of the, uh, the divine reason which illuminated the human mind and eventually the human mind and human s self appropriated that sense of confidence so that God died and, and man, capital M, became in some sense divinized as the highest conscious intelligence in the universe. And so it was a new center. By it, like the sun, it, it could um, shine its light and brilliantly illuminate everything in the universe and understand it with its rational power. Um, and this was, uh, uh, allowed it to connect deeply to the, to the understandings of the divine mind that went back to uh, uh, Platonic and Pythagorean um, uh, sources. But this was a largely unconscious process but by the time you get to the 20th century cosmos, well, the sun is just another dying star that's one amongst billions. It's not like, so just as the Homo sapiens is one species among many um, that's also dying, so is our sun. And, what the, uh, and the, in a much vaster cosmic kind of void of meaning. And so, uh, in all these different ways, there's a, a kind of postmodern descent. The, the patriarchal self is critiqued, uh, Virginia Woolf um, and um, Simone de Beauvoir and, uh, and the, um, Catherine Keller and so forth. You, ha you have the deconstruction of the objective uh, scientific uh, perspective from, by people like uh, uh, and um, fire abend in, in philosophy of science. You have the deconstruction of the Western um, confidence and superiority as being Eurocentric by post-colonial thought. Um, okay, so there's many, many different forces are going into this descent. Now, Hillman is playing a, uh, basically, um, you have here in the postmodern, you have a certain, on the one hand, this kind of gr greatly decentered, uh, uh, diminished self that lives in an interpretive universe with multiple realities uh, and a great sense of uncertainty. Uh, but there is, um, there starts to be questions as to, you know, where does. Um, where, where does meaning come from? And while some are locked into an existentialist isolation, others st uh, start to experience the potential of a relational uh, reality that in which meaning is not uh, located exclusively in the human being. So, uh, or um, uh, in, uh, as a projection of the human subject. So there's an uncertainty, there's a multiplicity, there's a plurality, um, there's an interpretive uh, um, n n participatory nature uh, of the certain forms of the postmodern worldview that starts to emerge. Now depth psychology, as Freud already saw, is part of mediating this great descent. It's a descent into the underworld of the unconscious, of the deep psyche. In the same way that uh, astronomy through Hubble and then the Hubble telescope, but, uh, but partic already in the 1920s uh, and 30s, that radical expansion of the universe to, to, to the billions of galaxies, billions and billions of stars, uh, the, the vast cosmos, the dark matter, the, the mis mysteries of quantum uh, relativistic physics and so forth is paralleled by a sudden um, 
uh, opening of the, the deep psyche of the unconscious um, with its dark matter, with its decentering of the human ego rather than of the, uh, of, of the earth or the, or, or the sun. And um, he, <clears throat> while Freud, in many ways, as if you read, as, especially the last 20 years of Freud's life, if you read uh, his work, you recognize the, 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 the despair, the profound sense of disillusionment as he was dealing with a disenchanted universe uh, and um, a, he did not have from his own experience a sense of connecting to um, a numinous ground of meaning that could uh, redeem his existence and place it in a, uh, a, a more um, uh, a context of processive meaning. It was much more being locked into a disenchanted universe driven by instincts with um, uh, moral values that were not supported by the nature of being but were a kind of uh, necessary courageous effort, losing effort on the part of civilization to hold itself together and just as one's ego was trying to hold itself together and the best that psych psychotherapy could hope to bring about is a kind of realistic amelioration of misery, but m misery would still be the, the nature of one's experience. Jung clearly went, uh, had more profound transformative experiences. He, in a sense, was closer, a as he was with his um, patients, to um, the psychotic rather than the neurotic. He went deeper. He was at a more archetypal level. Um, he went through a kind of shamanic descent. He did this uh, and turned the corner. And that's why, like, the, this, this, these little lines of pot potential meaning in the world could represent, for example, synchronicities, seeing the possibility of meaning existing outside the human and not just inside. Um, and Jung is definitely connecting to the, the primal worldview of, ensouled, uh, of the ensouled nature. And he's so affected by the Swiss um, mountains and, and lakes and, and uh, forests of his, of his childhood, of his entire life. And that, uh, as he described it, he said where he grew up, it was essentially a medieval um, uh, kind of semi-pagan um, uh, kind of primordial sensibility in which magical things were happening and, and spirits and uh, uh, meaningful coincidences were uh, happening all the time and clocks were stopping as people were dying and so forth. Um, so he's very much connected with this worldview. He's also very much connected to the the vision of the uh, great religious um, traditions, uh, uh, y y Judaism, uh, Christianity, uh, but also um, Hinduism um, and, uh, and, and and Taoism and different Eastern thinkers. But he particularly is working within the Christian mythos. And he's very much identified with being a modern scientist. He says, bottom line, I'm a physician, I'm a scientist, I'm an empiricist. That's Jung. He's, he's, holding, his, he, he's holding his identity solid as he goes through his descent into the underworld in the 19-teens. The way he's man maintaining some connection to a potential sanity is by reminding himself that he's Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. This is in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Um, that he's Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, he has uh, his patients that he's going to see in the morning. He's married with five children. He lives at this address uh, in Kusnak, etc. cetera. Um, and that identification as a kind of scientist, physician, empiricist uh, is crucial um, to his descent. 
but he's also recognizing that, the, that a kind of um, a death of the hero needs to take place in this process. And he then is getting glimpses uh, of a kind of reconnection to a, a, a primal um, participation mystique, but with a new sense of reflexivity that's been forged in this uh, long process. Now Hillman comes along, and um, I'll just I'll just start this part part, and then we'll we'll take our break. Uh, and um, Hillman is ba archetypal psychology is basically uh, mediating both this point here, the descent, but it's also um, mediating in different ways uh, this this point in the mandalic spiral. Um, uh, we'll see particularly next week as we read Anima Mundi, the, th the return of the soul to the world. I mean, it, that almost says it right there. The re Anima Mundi, the, the, the ensouled world, the soul of the world, the return of the soul to the world. He's already um, in the very title of that essay uh, gesturing towards uh, a reconnection with as well as a revisioning of this uh, primal worldview. But I want to emphasize to begin with, to understand Hillman and to understand uh, what you've been reading in revisioning psychology, you really need to see uh, the extent to which he is essentially um, uh, almost as a sacred quest impelling this descent from the modern and this uh, negation of the uh, tr transcendental um, spiritualism of the axial period. Um, all that focus on breaking away from the monotheistic unity to the polytheistic um, multi multiplicity, the pluralism, from also from a certain truth which both the Cartesian self had and the um, biblical uh, self had a sense of, of what was a certain truth is now a move to uncertainty, to indeterminacy, to ambiguity. Um, and his whole movement away from spirit and, and spirit and mind and towards soul and the depths. His, his motion is depth, downward. Um, and his, his uh, struggle against um, uh, God, Hebraism, uh, Yahweh, and positing instead the gods, partly for the multiplicity, but partly it's a, it's a hearkening back to that polytheistic um, archaic vision that informed the Greek, uh, ancient Greek uh, perspective. And of course, against Christianity in particular, the carrier of the main uh, uh, stream religious um, uh, tradition in, in, the, in the West, that's his particular uh, uh, bete noir. <clears throat> and um, he very cleverly pinpoints those places uh, where this connection is made between the modern science, this robust, confident modern scientific self in an objective, literal world. He connects that to the um, the, the religious uh, Christian background to it by uh, starting his book with a kind of critique of people like uh, Mersenne, uh, the black-robed um, nominalist, and, and of nominalism, and of, of the, also the Protestant r uh, reformers who were the roundhead um, uh, literalists who were breaking up the, the images of the divine because they wanted to, to just have that pure relationship to an unimaged um, uh, glory of God and he you know where he says the roundheads you know the Puritan roundheads were had uh, uh, more concrete uh, minds than than the than the they were more concrete than the than the stones they were shattering as they were breaking up the um, the church icons uh, he He's, he's seeing the, the points that connect these two, and he's seeing these are the enemies. He's, he's, he's deconstructing the heroic ego, the American heroic ego, the inflated, 
sense of optimism. Uh, 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 he, he deconstructs that sense of the humanistic self-confidence of being special as human. Um, so, uh, he, 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 his focus is uh, against um, uh, progress. Uh, that that's a, a fantasy, the progress fantasy, the science fantasy, um, the God fantasy. That you, he, he uses the word fantasy like a weapon to, to deconstruct um, the pretensions of these previous worldviews to mediate a descent into the soul, uh, into the uncertain, into the depths, into the mysterious, into the nighttime dream life. Uh, into the world of, of, of images and never resolved um, uh, uh, meanings. And he does this through a, a kind of um, affirmation of, of not only multiplicity in the polytheistic, but also of a fragmentation of deconstructing the old definite sense of reality and selfhood and embracing the symptom, the psychopathology, the, the neurosis, the depression, the, 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 the suffering, the feeling that I don't understand and I can't make it better. Um, uh, melancholy, suffering, and his embrace of seeing through. He's constantly seeing through things, seeing through to the, the fantasy, and that's a, that's a, that skeptical deconstruction of these previous worldviews. So in some sense, he's, uh, he's doing a via negativa. Um, a, 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 he's forwarding a negative project in order to permit his affirming project, which is an affirmation of soul, imagination, and what will lead to a, a eventually uh, uh, in the, and by the time of the 80s, which we'll f focus on next week with the Anima Mundi essay, eventually to a, a recovery of the uh, ensouled world. Okay, I think I'm going to take our, uh, uh, I'll suggest we take our break right now, and then uh, when we come back, I'll just say a few more things about this um, contextualizing of, of Hillman in the, in the larger uh, context of, of Western intellectual history. <laughs>